Hey, what is up mortals? Tim here. And before we get into today's video, there is something I want to say. I want to let you all know that we have a merch store. Some of the items in it are only available for a limited amount of time. So if you're interested, go into the description and check it out. Each purchase helps us make more content. Secondly, if you guys didn't know, only 41.3% of you guys are subscribed to us. So please hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the story. Now I'd be willing to wager the fact that you have heard people talk about superheroes for a while at this point, what with the rise in popularity of Disney's Marvel franchise and the painful to watch efforts of the DC franchise. Superheroes are now more mainstream than ever before. And of course, it was inevitable that the love we have for these spandex-clad badasses would ooze its way into the shonen anime genre we all know and love. Which, of course, brings us to My Hero Academia. An anime whose viewer count can only really be bested by how many damn Crunchyroll anime awards it can collect. But that's a topic for another day, my friend. Because today, we are discussing, or rather attempting to explain, what exactly is All Might's muscle form? Is it linked to one for all? Or is it... Something else. Let's find out, shall we? So we all, should, know at this point All Might is, or rather was, the world's symbol of peace and single most powerful hero. Now, be that as it may, you would be forgiven for thinking that All Might was just born this way, that he has always been the strongest, the most capable, and most powerful guy around. But in fact, the truth is the polar opposite. You see, in season two of the anime and chapter 41 of the manga, it is revealed that much like Izuku, All Might wasn't born with the quirk, or so we are to believe anyways. Instead, his quirk was given to him. All Might is in fact the eighth user to receive this quirk, and his main shtick throughout season one is his efforts to pass his quirk, one for all, onto its next user, Izuku Midoriya, who was coincidentally enough born quirkless as well. Now, most people take this information at face value and not really ever think about it again unless it is brought up at some point down the line. But not me. <laughs> no, 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 not me. It is my theory that All Might was in fact born with a quirk. Let me explain. Now, if we look at the series lore and the way that One for All is supposed to work according to the rules laid out for it, it makes sense that All Might does in fact possess a quirk that he did not receive through One for All a quirk that he did not inherit from one of the past users of One for All, and that he was, in fact, born with it. It could be that he just never knew about it. To make my thought process easier to understand, allow me to rather quickly, and quite sloppily all things considered, explain the range of quirks present in the world of My Hero Academia. All quirks, at least as far as we know as of right now, fall into one of three camps. These camps are Mutant, Emitter, and Transformation Quirks. Transformation quirks, well, they transform or change the user's body in some way, shape, or form. This includes becoming a giant woman like Mount Lady, but it also includes Kirishima's hardening and Tetsu Tetsu's steel quirks, respectively, which allows them to harden certain parts, or all, of their bodies to their respective maximum tensile strengths. Moving on to the quirks of the mutant variety, mutant quirks are classified as a quirk that changes the user's body in some way, shape, or form, much like transformation quirks. Only thing is, these changes are 100% permanent. Some notable examples would be Toru's invisibility, Jiro's earphone jack, and Ojiro's tail, all of which are quirks that are permanently in use. And lastly, there are, of course, the emitter quirks, my personal favorite. These cover pretty much any other quirk. They can be turned on and off, but do not alter the user's appearance in any way, shape, or form, save for lighting them on fire or covering them in ice. Yes, Todoroki, I'm looking at you. These quirks tend to mess with physics a lot, making things fly like Ochako, making them elastic like Gentle Criminal, or disassembling and reassembling things on a molecular level, such as Kai Chisaki, Overhaul, and Tomura Shigaraki. And now that your head has been topped off with your daily dose of useless knowledge that will next to never help you out in the real world, let's use this newfound information to examine One for All. Now, first of all, while One for All is technically a single quirk, depending on who you ask that is, for all intents and purposes, it does two things. First and foremost, it is a quirk that collectively grows stronger over time. 
but it also is a quirk that retains all of its strength while having the ability to be passed on to others. With the caveat that the next user has to work their way up to 100% usage before they can start building on top of what is already available. With that said, a constant with one for all is the fact that with every new user, the quirk becomes stronger than it was before. This is how All Might himself became the most powerful hero the world has ever seen as the 8th user. Yet we next to never hear anyone mention his predecessors. But herein lies the titular question. Why does All Might look like this when he is using one for all, and look like this when he isn't? Now taking the information I just gave you on quirk types into consideration, tell me what type of quirk you think All Might's one for all is. Did you say transformation? If you did, that would make sense, right? I mean, just look at All Might. Not only does he change in physical form, but it is because of this physical change that All Might was able to harness 100% of One for All right off the bat. But no, in fact the manga and wiki both explicitly classifies it as an emitter quirk. Which, as you know, means that they do not change the appearance or physical form of their users whatsoever. Now you could brush this off as a creative direction, tell me that I have cherries to pick and I'm just picking away. But look at this. When Midoriya uses One for All, his body doesn't change, save for the lightning and the red lines when using his full cowling at 8%, or even the unstable 20%, he never gets physically larger. But now I can see the comments already saying, but Tim, we still haven't seen Midoriya reach 100% usage yet, so how do you know? Hmm? Well, my trigger happy friends, that's where you would be wrong, because in chapters 156 through 159 of the manga, or episode 75 through 77 of the anime, with some assistance from Eri, we see Izuku reach 100% usage in his fight against Overhaul. And we still never see his body make a single physical change, whether that be getting larger, smaller, or what have you. And quick sidebar for all of you anime fans out there, it is later cleared up in volume 9 of the manga that Izuku is not in fact using 1 million percent of one for all in his fight against Overhaul. Instead, that was something Izuku said as a way to psych himself up, and those words come directly from the lips of the manga's author, Kohei Horikoshi. Another fairly popular theory can be found on the My Hero Academia wiki, which follows along the same lines in the fact that he isn't actually using 1 million percent of one for all. The wiki states that Izuku is in fact using 100% of his Detroit Smash and 100% of his Delaware Smash simultaneously, making the Delaware Detroit Smash at most a 200% usage of one for all. And even still, people will contest that estimate, but I digress. Furthermore, in chapter 95 of the manga, we start to see the negative effects giving up one for all begins to have on All Might, as what little amount of one for all he has left begins to fade away. He says, quote, The symbol of hope is dead. The embers inside of me have vanished. We later see him mention while conversing with Izuku that, quote, The embers of one for all inside me are gone. And what's more, I can't maintain my muscle form anymore. Now the distinction he makes here is certainly up for interpretation. But if you were to ask me, I say that this confirms the fact that one for all and All Might's muscle form are not in fact one and the same. They are two different things. I mean, think about it. Why mention the muscle form unless it is separate from One for All, and assuming for a second that his muscle form is in fact just part of One for All, and all of One for All has truly left his body, why is he repeatedly able to change back to his muscle form even for a second? If what he said earlier in the chapter is believed to be true, all of this, Everything we have covered throughout this video seems to suggest that yes, in fact, All Might possesses some form of transformation quirk, which allows him to change into his muscle form at will before he received one for all. And as if that isn't enough proof, just listen to the way Gran Torino describes his training All Might in Chapter 47, or Episode 27 of the anime. He says, quote, He was pretty much able to use one for all right off the bat. Of course he had the body going for him, so there's that. We are then shown a flashback to when Gran Torino was training All Might, and his body looks no different than that of Izuku's, maybe a little bit scrawnier even. This same point is made in an offhand comment made during Izuku's strength training period of the entrance exam arc, where All Might says, quote, I was able to control 100% almost immediately. 
This all seems to point towards the fact that there is something different between Izuku and All Might. I mean, think about it. They both received the same quirk as relatively scrawny high schoolers who were supposedly born quirkless. Yet for whatever reason, All Might was able to use 100% of One for All right off the bat. Sounds kind of fishy if you ask me, and all of this information seems to point in the same direction. All Might has a transformation quirk, namely his muscle form, that only surfaced after he received One for All. And it's not like late bloomers aren't a thing in this universe. In fact, the original possessor of One for All was just that, a late bloomer. Let me explain. So for those of you who aren't in the know, it is explained during the Hideout Raid arc that there was once a man who could steal quirks from people and give any of his stored quirks to anyone he wished. This man flew under the moniker of All For One. However, All For One had a brother who was appalled by his actions. This brother of his was born without a quirk, or so they thought. You see, in an act of defiance, All For One gave his brother a quirk that allowed him to constantly build up more and more power within his body. But what he did not account for was a second quirk that had not activated until One For All was introduced to his body. This quirk allowed him to pass his quirks onto other people, but not take different quirks from others by force like his brother had. These two quirks joined together to become One For All as we know it today. A quirk that constantly grows in power and can be passed on from generation to generation. So now that we have established the canonical fact that late bloomers are a thing, why couldn't All Might be one? Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive goes over the hard facts of the anime presented. Now, in case you guys didn't know, Anime Theory is an offshoot of We the Celestials What If videos. Our What If series offers the question of what if this happened to a character in an anime, and it takes it off on a different tangent than the canon anime available. Please, if you're interested in content like that, go check out the description below and also click the eye icon in the top right corner. With that out of the way, let's get back into our story. Thank you all for watching the video to the end. Now, with that out of the way, there's a few more things I need to plug before the video's over. On behalf of We the Celestials, I want to thank the writer of this video as well as the editor for this video. Their details will be in the description below. If you're a voice actor, editor, or writer, or you're just interested in becoming one of those, go to the Discord that is in the description of this video and hit up the head of one of those departments. We're always looking for members to join us. That's it from us for today's video. So thank you all for watching, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're interested, and hit that like button if you like this video. Until next time, peace out mortals, have an amazing day.